I'm going to read um, some poems from my three most recent collections. The first poem I'm going to read is from Futures Pass, which came out in 2019 by uh, Salmon Poetry. The first poem is a poem from my London childhood. My childhood is split between London and Ireland, and in Ireland it's split between Brusner in Kerry and Temple Glanton in Limerick. But this is a piece of autobiography from London when I was a young fellow. Famous mice. The one my father trapped in the stainless steel kitchen sink and drowned under the hot tap. The three-quarter moon, a cut coin through the net curtain. The one whose bite I nibbled from a half-biscuit, breathing in its rank whiff. A coconut macaroon, a sweet moon. The one who stopped the washing machine for a week, and then the man came in a blue bibbon brace, and the mouse was a pulp splodge in the works. The one I cornered in the skirting board and set free, believing it was me. The one I imagined curled in the grey right eye of the moon. The one our neighbour's cat brought live from the railway embankment. The day moon's face inscrutable in the afternoon sky. The one I never saw but heard the pattering of. The one yet to be born. The one yet to be caught. The one in the broken moon of my skull when I die. The grey one. The brown one. The door one. The grass one. The field one. The hazel one. The one. Poets respond to themselves. We respond to memory. We respond to the things that happen to us. But also it's the duty of the poet to respond to things outside ourselves. Things that might make us happy. Things that might make us sad. Things that might make us angry. The thing about poetry even when it's hang angry, even when it's sad, it must always aspire to being beautiful, even when it's showing something utterly horrible. Our father escapes by rain. Daddy's grassy fields had been driven in by the feet of cattle. A stone black bull throating complaint shone from the rainy hill. She took nine steps up steps of exposed stone, slippery rocks that jutted through the grass, until she stood before the bull, his head massive his hide grazed where earlier he'd shoved his way out of the bullshed. The bright brass ring, like an aruberos of golden snot, pinched through his nostrils, hung with a milk of lesser snot. The bull puffed rancid breath, stepped through her as if she were fog, a silk nothing like the rain itself, sopping rot. Daddy's constant rapes would keep their secret. I'm going to read now from my most uh, current collection, uh, Visions at Temple Glanton, uh, which was published just this year, at the end of April, uh, by the Revival Press. This is a very personal book. It's um, a visionary book. It's a book of memory, and it's a book 
about poetry and about poets. Um, my father is from Inshabam in Temple Blanton, which actually is a for short walk from where Michael Hartnett stayed in the townland of Glendara. I spent a lot of my childhood mainly in Brusna, in my mammy's place, but at the same time, a formative time in Temple Blanton. A ducus from my mammy is that from a very young age, I've seen things and I've heard things that no one else sees or hears. When I was a young boy, I thought these experiences were common, but I learned very quickly that they weren't. So I had nobody I could talk to about them. The only one who had experiences like this in common to myself was my mammy, who even in London would hear the banshee. All through my life, I've seen things and heard things. A woman's voice has been in my head since I was a young fellow. Sometimes telling me interesting things, sometimes talking and saying things that make no sense, even now as an adult, and other times kind of giving out to me. At first I thought this woman was me granny from Brussels, because I thought that's how grannies spoke to their grandchildren when we were a great distance away, because my granny was in Brussels, and most of the time I was in London. But then I realised that the woman speaking in my head wasn't my granny. She was someone else, something else, something far older, far more ancient. And this book, Visions at Temple Blanton, really examines some of those experiences. Last year, um, I went through a period of a few weeks where past visions and present visions and memory and history seemed to suddenly coalesce in my mind. And I sat down and in the space of about two weeks, I wrote the first part of this book, a sequence of poems called Visions at Temple Blanton. And I'm going to read a few of those now. None of them have titles, they just speak themselves. The barmaid trims froth from the glasses of porter with a tailor's scissors. In the slop tray there is enough for her unwedding dress of dunnish scum. You pull a sewing needle from the lapel of your dying jacket with the loosened threads that hold your sleeves you sew her dress in place piece by piece less borrowed thread by borrowed thread your jacket slips to the ground in her new dress of dull foam she steps to the window even the clearest light cannot brighten her unwedding train. Like a snail, she leaves a trail of stain as she steps out to the church. You follow in your grubby shirt sleeves. Thrushes are hoarse in the hedges. The blackbirds turn silver. You utter a poem of clichés to the spermatozoa you lost. Squadrons of sperm as lifeless as that dress evaporating in sunlight. A noise of violet has been in your head all morning. Your neighbour has sent you out to the meadow to capture 
the golden horse. He has given you a halter made of twisted straw. You do not believe in the golden horse. You believe the halter to be useless. The noise in your head stops. Violet is no longer colouring your mind. In the meadow, a golden horse is standing in the sunlight. You believe. On seeing you, the horse steps away, away into the shadow of the trees. It is no longer golden, you see now, but covered all over in mud. The horse evades you continually, trotting away at each approach. You throw the halter at it in exasperation. The noise in your head starts up. Violet is mined. The horse bends down and eats the straw halter. Violet wells up, overflowing. The horse's whinny sounds sarcastic, sounds triumphant as it trots away. In exasperation this time, you shout, Stop! The word is violet. The horse stops. You realise that the halter is in the horse now because violet is certain in all matters. Once upon the horse, you take hold of its mane. Take hold of its mane as fierce as you can. Carry me to the sky woman, you say to the horse, for I wish to present you to her. The horse gallops with certainty, for Violet commands it. At great speed it crosses the meadow. At great speed its hooves gain purchase in the air. You are astride it amongst the clouds. The noise in your head stops. You lose your sense of certainty. You falter. Your grip becomes faithless and the horse senses it and shakes you. You fall through the sky. Another certainty becomes manifest. A soft thumping, like the subtle drumming of fingers, is at the window. You draw back the curtain and the glass is crowded with moths. The moon is full and still apparent through the massed bodies. You step out into the night. Yellow moonlight pours from your hands like honey. So much does it flow to or from your face, you are unsure which, that you are dazzled by it. Your garden has swollen since dusk, and a steep hill blocks your house. Your garden has climbed upwards into the night sky. But how could this be if you could still see the moon through your window? The moon is embedded in the garden, high up near the peak, like a golden jewel. Three hooded women stand before you. They are wearing moonlight, a moonlight so dense and cloying that it hides their bodies completely. You are wearing it too. You realise this as you look down at yourself. The moonlight is wrapped about you, has dissolved your clothing, even your hair. The moths hover about you, around the three women too. The women ascend the steep hill 
and you follow, stepping upon its lit grass. The surface of the hill is in motion and it carries you up to the embedded moon. At the summit, the moon is gone. The moths are legion. They cover everything. No light can penetrate them now. One by one, they cover the women who disappear accordingly, one at a time. Then the moths gather for you. Darkness then, a complete and overwhelming darkness. A terrible tearing, like a fathomless grief, descends overhead. You wake to it. The noise is continuous, without break, pouring from the night sky. You dress quickly and go outside. The sky is cloudless and full of stars, and the noise is coming from each of those bright, brittle points in the night. A thudding in the grass startles you, and you look down. A hare is surveying you. It bolts away, but not too far before stopping. It turns and looks again. You see a young boy. It's you, the ghost of something you were. The boy has a jagged stone in his hands, and he throws this viciously at the hare. The hare drops to the ground. The boy is gone. There is only you, the loss of a stone suddenly in your hand. You look at the hare, but that is gone too. In its place, in a heap is an old woman. You recognize her. She is your grandmother. She is lifeless, her skin gray under starlight, her clothes the same. You pick her up and she is as light as a bundle of dry sticks. A flash illuminates the meadow. 40 yards distant, 35 yards distant, 30 yards, 25 yards, a blue sheet of lightning is approaching. You walk to meet it with your lifeless grandmother in your arms. You know that lightning is an invigorant to hares, that they frolic in it. You know instinctively that the lightning can revive her. The sheet of light is now upon you. Grandmother falls to pieces in your grasp. A hare is suddenly thudding away through the meadow. You are a light full of a fathomless grief. You are a bright, brittle point in the night. Blue becomes white, becomes blue, becomes white, becomes blue, becomes white, becomes... Your father's 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 father is long dead. You never knew him. You never even heard speak of him, not even his name. He calls to your door. You recognise him immediately. He is wearing a coat made of earwigs, all of them clinging madly to each other. The earwigs are fraying at the hem. Some fall to the ground in your hallway. You see the moon now, 
just one grey eye peeping out from its face. Come out with me to the half-faced moon, says your father's 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 father. You follow him without hesitation. Your feet break the dewy grass as you make your way down the meadow. Something stirs low on the ground, its face shining palely in the half-faced moonlight. Come meet with me, the horned badger, says your father's 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 father. You look again. The pale stripe on the badger's face is lumping up. It rises skywards, a thin spectral horn of off-white fur. Come climb with me, the horn of the horned badger, says your father's 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 father. He steps on the badger's back and shimmies up the thin furry horn. You follow him up, up all the way to the half-faced moon. Earwigs fall down from the hem of his coat, gather on your crown as a writhing cap. Come dress with me in the cloth of the tailor's tailor, says your father's 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 father. I'm going to finish with one poem from my collection, Inverted Night, which is a collection of surrealist poems and came out by Servision Books in uh, 2019. Surrealism is a state where you let your mind become another, when you let your mind be something else. The trick with surrealism, though, is to look at the real world while your mind is unreal. As you've probably already gathered, my mind was fairly unreal at birth. So I'm going to read this poem. This poem is about the world as it is now. It's about the world as we have brought it up to its state now. And it's about us. Earthright. You who bequeathed to us the dandelions, an apron's worth of stars upon the meadow, we have come to tear out your teeth as you sleep. You cannot but sense us beside your bed. We are that which you dream of, pulling at your mouth. Wake now and find us gone and your mouth full of life. You whose mouth erupts in gobbets of scarlet flowing. You who will no longer bite at the heels of the morning. You who bequeath to us the dandelions. You speak the deep night that becomes our sky forever. Thank you. Thank you.